In adjunctions three, we showed that every adjunction gives rise to a monad. Now, you might think to yourself, hmm, what about the other way around? Does every monad give rise to an adjunction? And that turns out to be an excellent question. And the answer is yes. And moreover, the answer is a very nice kind of yes. And it turns out that, that two different solutions were found to this, more or less at the same time. One by Kleisley and one by Ida Mervyn Moore. And one of them turned out to be initial and one of them turned out to be terminal. Isn't that nice? So initial and terminal in what, you might say? Well, it turns out that given, uh, um, given what? Given a category C, there is an entire category of adjunctions giving rise to the same monad. Did I say that right? No, probably not. Given a monad on a category C, there's an entire category of adjunctions giving rise to it. And this category always has an initial object and a terminal object. And we'll show what those are. And so that, what that means is that given any adju other adjunction giving rise to that monad, you can sort of pin it down in relation to the initial object in the category and the terminal object in the category. Um, so let's see what I'm talking about here. Given, so the question is, given a monad T on a category C, uh, is there an adjunction given right to it? So remember, given an adjunction F left adjoint to G, it gives rise to a monad GF. So that's what giving rise to means here. Now, we've seen the category of algebras for a monad T. And it turns out that this is the terminal object I was talking about among all adjunctions giving rise to the same monad. So we can use this to construct a very nice canonical adjunction um, that gives rise to this monad. This turns out to be the terminal solution to this question, which is why the category of algebras for T is often also called the eilenberg moore category. So we've seen the category of algebras for T, which we can also write as this C with a T up there to show that it's sort of based on C somehow and constructed using the monad T. And the reason that we're going to do that is that secretly later for the Kleisley category we might write it there with the T at the bottom to show it's, the, it's somehow the duo of this thing. So what we're looking for in this adjunction we're going to have an adjunction like this um, which we might write as F upper T left adjoint to G upper T to show that they are the canonical ones. I'll probably drop those upper T's in a second because when we're proving it, it's, we're going to be using just F and G and assuming that it is this F and G I'm constructing. There, that was a ramble. Um, so the point is, let's just think for a second about one of our key examples, which was the, the example of the monad for monoids. And here, you can think to yourself, set... And here you can think to yourself, monoids, the category of monoids. And here we had the free monoid construction. And here we had the forgetful functor that took a monoid and went back to its underlying set. And this is going to guide our way through forming this adjunction. Because what we're going to do is we're make, going to make an algebra freely. And we're going to, to start with an algebra over here. And we're going to forget back down to its underlying object, C. So it's easy to construct G. G is easy because it's going to go from C, T to C like this. Remember, what does an algebra for T look like? It looks like an underlying object A together with an algebra action evaluating all the operations in here and sending them to here. So in the monoid case, this is the underlying set of the monoid. This is the free monoid on that set and this, the right, and then this evaluates where all those operations actually end up in the underlying set. So in this case, we wanted to take what? We wanted to take the underlying set of the monoid. So how do we take the underlying set of the monoid? It's this underlying object. That's a perfectly good functor from CT to C. On the other hand, how are we going to make the free thing? Well, if we start with an object in A, what can we make as an algebra here? We're going to express it as an underlying object together with an action. Now, let's just think very hard about the, free, the, the monoid example. How do you make the free monoid? And remember, we want to express the free monoid as an algebra for T. 
What's the underlying set of the free monoid on A? Anyone? Anyone? Yes, it's Tn. Right? And so that's the underlying set of the free monoid on A. So to make an algebra on it, we've got to have some kind of action from T squared A to TA. What have we possibly got? What could it possibly be? The product. Well, it could be the multiplication, right? So now what we've got to do immediately is check to show that that really is an algebra. Okay, now I've run out of space. Typical problem. Uh, I can just get rid this. So this is our supposed algebra. Let's check that it really is one. Check. Uh, we're going to check that mu a gives an algebra for t. So what do we have to do? There are two axioms, remember, there's the triangle, which says this. You do e to a, wait, e to, this is our underlying object, so it's got to be t a, e to a, t a, and then we do the algebra action. And blow me down! It's one of the monad axioms. Fancy that. What a coincidence. Of course, it's not a coincidence. It's all very beautiful. Uh, and the other axiom is we've got to start with t squared a. And on the one hand, we have to do, wait, I've done it again. It's t cubed a because it's t squared a where a is the underlying object. So our underlying object is t a. So it's t squared of t a, which is t cubed. And now we've got to do, on the one hand, t theta. Well, what's t theta? That's theta, so this is t mu. And on the other hand, we've got to do mu t. So this takes us down to t squared a. And then we have to do theta in both directions. So this is theta, and this is theta. And well, I never. It's the other monad axiom. axiom. Fancy that. So that shows that it really is an algebra. Fine. So it shows that we have to find a functor going this way and a functor going the other way. So the next thing we have to do is define... Um, well, we could do this in various ways, but one thing we can do is define an eta and an epsilon for this, this adjunction. Where are we going to do it? Goodness knows. We're going to do it. Um, sorry, I just rubbed it out. Um, so, we now need to define a unit and per unit. Okay? So the unit, eta, has to go from... Uh, G, it's got to go from 1 to G, F. So now let's think about this very carefully. This is 1 on C and it's going to G, F. So we've got to have on components, we've got to have something from A to G, F of A. Now what's G, F of A? F of A is this new thing, right? And then to forget, G is the forgetful thing where we forget down to the underlying object. So that's just T, A. So this is T A, and this is A, so what could we possibly have as the unit? Well, fancy that, it could just be the unit for the monad. And now I've got some slightly strange notational problems, because I've got eta and eta. Well, it's a coincidence that isn't very coincidental. Oh, what should I do? Okay, this is, is the unit for T, and now what about the co-unit? We need epsilon at some algebra, so this is epsilon on, say, a to A, and it's got to go from F G of this algebra to the algebra. So it's got to be a map of algebras. Now what's this? What's F G of this thing? This is first you forget down to A and then you do the free thing on it. So it's the free algebra on A, which is given by mu like this. What's this? Well that's just That's just that. So what possible morphism could there be going from there to there? Oh, well, fancy that. We could put theta in here. I mean, if you look on the board, there's only one single... Uh-oh, I've only got 30 seconds left. There's only one morphism going from TA to A. So we're going to put theta there, and then we have to check that this really is a morphism of algebras, which means that this diagram commutes. Does it commute? Yes, it does. It's the second algebra axiom. So I'll leave it to you to check that the, the triangle identities commute.